Good morning. My name is Maureen McCarthy and I am research faculty at the Desert Research Institute and the University of Nevada, Reno in Northern Nevada. And I'm also project director for Native Waters on Narrowed Lands. Um, today, I'm gonna to be talking to you about facing the co concurrent emergencies of COVID-19 and climate change in the Indian country. So first, let me introduce to you the concept of the project, Native Waters on Arid Lands. So our project is focused on really understanding climate impacts on water resiliency and for tribal agriculture throughout the Western United States, in particular in the arid lands in the Southwest and the Great Basin, but also up into the Northern Rockies and the Great Plains. So first, let me introduce you to my team, our team. Um, we are partnered with several research institutes, uh, the Tribal College Network through Falcon um, and uh, federally recognized tribal extension agents throughout working throughout Indian country. And of course, tribal communities um, in our study area all over. So as many of us um, may forget at this point in time, but before COVID, there was indeed a climate change epidemic and it was hitting Indian country very hard. So I always like to start these talks with a quote from our collaborator, Carletta Chief. Um, she really captures the importance of water um, in the sacred traditions and also ties it to understanding the value of native wisdom for understanding water stress, which is at the root after all of much of the climate impacts in the arid lands in the Western United States. So we take an approach of looking at uh, windows across both time and climate. Um, so I'm just gonna take you on a very short tour of our project, and then we'll move into the issues that uh, we've been dealing with with COVID. So one of the first things to remember is that the climate has always been changing. Um, climate change is not something that just started 150 years ago. Um, and this slide and the following slides really show to you um, the, the changes in climatic patterns over uh, long periods of time. So in this case, about 12,000 years. So global temperatures over the past 10,000 years have indeed been warmer. They have been cooler. Um, but what's noticeable in the last 150 years is that they're getting much warmer, much more quickly. Um, in particular, southwestern temperatures over the past 5,000 years show a pretty steady pattern um, with this tail or the hockey stick um, on the end, which indicates um, the, the exponential increase in temperatures. So temperatures have increased rapidly over the last century, um, and they now exceed those that we've seen in modern day climate, 12,000 years to the present, which is spans the time of uh, ancestors on the landscape in North America. So tied to climate obviously is drought and uh, tied to temperature is drought. And so if we look at the Palmer modified drought index over the past thousand years, um, positive indicates uh, wetter periods, negative indicates drier periods. You can see exceeding extensive drought periods um, throughout the last thousand years. Um, and they have been periodic, but the recent drought periods that we've seen, particularly in the Four Corners region, are extreme, um, particularly the areas around be before and after the 2018 period. So the summer of 2018 was the fourth most extensive drought in Northern Arizona over the last thousand years, as many people will attest to and many tribal communities have experienced firsthand. So what do we do to deal with that? Well, one of the big issues is to understand how the seasons are changing uh, with these warming temperatures, how precipitation patterns, temperature patterns are really impacting agricultural patterns. Um, and so we do a lot of work directly with our tribal partners to understand how um, temperature and precipitation changes are manifested in terms of agricultural production. 
Uh, one of the keys to our project is really teaching by seeing and learning. So this was a, a tour we took with students and faculty and researchers uh, to Chaco Canyon with one of our lead researchers um, who's an archaeologist giving us a tour of Chaco Canyon so we could step back in time um, to uh, previous drought periods when things were really ex exceedingly difficult on Pueblo and cultures understand what resiliency aspects they had then and how those manifest um, to the present time. So one of the keys um, to our project is really understanding the integration of native wisdom and Western science. We can't do this from one perspective or another. We really need to bring those two components um, together to understand how we as humans interact with the natural world and how we're part of it and how we've built resilience and how these impacts have changed over time. But water stress and, and things that are related to climate are not just compounded by warming temperatures. They're also very intricately tied to historical land use, water policies, governments, and the economic situation on the reservations. And so part of our project has really been able to understand all of those processes, as well as the physical processes of warming climate and changes in precipitation. A key part of our project is really to be able to make climate data useful to all the communities that we work with. So that means in the old days doing in-person um, workshops um, to really look at how changes in climate really are manifested um, on individual communities. And that's really involved downscaling the climate data, the, the precipitation data and the temperature data for each particular reservation um, so these are temperature changes um, projections for uh, two reservations, Gila River in the south of Arizona and Duck Valley in the northern part of Nevada and Idaho. Um, we can look at the projected uh, precipitation regimes for those two areas or for any tribal community that we work with. And then we turn that into agricultural terms. This is just one example of looking at um, changes in the precipitation distribution of rain versus snow. Um, when the first snowfall occurs, we've also looked at uh, warming temperatures, co colder, cooler temperatures, uh, onset of um, the first frost, um, uh, it changes in the, the percentage of uh, extreme storms, uh, precipitation rates, um, shifts in those times seasonally. So all those things are tied directly to the agricultural calendar and that's given us a, a window into understanding some of the resiliency that we need um, in terms of agriculture and in tribal communities. Um, but one of the key parts in our project has really been not just doing the research, but also moving that into the hands of the next generation. Um, and one of the ways we're doing that is working directly with teachers in, in communities to create place-based le lesson plans um, derived directly from our research um, that can be used with uh, students to understand climate impacts in their areas and climate resiliency in their areas. Ah, so that was all well and good. And we were trucking along um, over the last five, six years, looking at climate impacts. And then March 2020 happened. And COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic hit the world, um, but in particular, it hit Indian country exceedingly hard. So I had tremendous amount of respect for President Nez of the Navajo Nation, who really captures um, what's been going on when he said uh, that the pandemic has an, impacted every single person on the Navajo Nation and many, almost every indigenous person around the world as well. Um, but, but indigenous people are resilient and um, we will overcome this. Um, but the combination of the two has really put a stress on the system. So one of the first things that we did um, in the Native Waters on Arid Lands project was really to bring people together to work on these problems. So um, this is an example of our story map. I'll give you some links to it, um, which documents a lot of the things that we've been doing. But one of the first things was to kick off um, meetings. And we started in mid-March 
with Zoom meetings, of course, the whole world moved to Zoom. And we had tribal partners on the ground from our communities, from our colleges, from our um, FERTEP agents. And we came together with our federal agency partners led by USDA uh, involving FEMA, Forest Service, CDC, BIA, others as we needed them. And we identified urgent issues and then we went after them one after another. And we're still doing it and you are most welcome to join and I'll tell you how to do that at the end of the talk. So one of the things, and these, these are all documented on our story map page, um, one of the key things was really looking at what was going on on the ground. And I have to say the agencies were very patient with us um, because they couldn't see onto the ground and um, we needed to bring those issues to their forefront. So we came together and um, looked at key issues that we could address with our federal agencies immediately. And those included things like, um, you know, needing reimbursement for hay and, and water and moving livestock, um, wild fluctuations in the trading markets, um, which was really impacting tribal farmers and ranchers, particularly with livestock, um, operating loans, lease payments, um, a whole series of things um, that really needed to be addressed in addition to the basics of PPE and COVID testing. There were also some very uh, specific economic issues and we haven't addressed all of these, but we're, and we're still working through some of them. So if you have similar issues, please come join us. Um, issues of irrigation fees, lease payments have been a really big issue. Um, we had very specific issues for places like the Hopi when they ran out of wood supplies in early March and later on had issues getting hay in for their livestock. Um, and then of course now that we're in September, we're facing the educational challenges of uh, looking at how do students return to school in a virtual environment when they have limited access to um, electricity, computers, and the internet. So what were some of the things that we could do right away? Well, kudos to USDA for standing up the coronavirus food assistance program, pushing food boxes out to rural communities. And that's been a huge benefit. And there have been other programs that are similar to that. Uh, we undertook trying moving uh, hundreds of cords, um, now close to thousands of cords of wood up to Hopi and Navajo, along with PPE, hay supplies. Um, and those were uh, partnerships between our university partners, federal agencies, even private sector um, entities that really helped us move um, supplies out immediately so people could deal with the most pressing issue, which was keeping themselves safe and feeding their families and their livestock. So uh, while this was all going on since March, <laughs> Of course, the climate didn't stop changing. And so now we are facing the concurrent emergencies of climate and COVID. And what, what really is um, the underlying issues of climate, like I said, haven't gone away, but they have been compounded by um, what we're dealing with uh, with COVID. So, you know, obviously in the arid lands world um, and is uh, the major issue is drought. Um, these are projections from July. I have to tell you, they've gotten even worse recently. Um, but it does have, it shows you the three month projection. We had NOAA come brief our COVID working group um, to, to look at how the drought was changing. Um, it's been exceedingly bad in Southern Colorado, now moving into the full Four Corners region and up into the Great Basin, and obviously in parts of California as well. And it hasn't let up and it has gotten worse over the last few months. And the projections are not good looking forward as well. So we are still coping with very severe droughts that much of which are driven by changes in climate. Um, and compounding that are the wildfires. And um, you are probably well aware that California has a million and a half acres burned and more on the way, Arizona has had three times its um, 
uh, acreage burned this year. These pictures are actually from Salish Kootenai, uh, Confederated tribes of uh, Confederate Salish and Kootenai tribes in northern western Montana, um, fighting fires up there. Uh, one good thing that's come out of that is a look to tribal communities um, about what they've done and had traditionally done on the landscape to manage wildfires in the past. And now there is um, an outreach and a recognition that tribal knowledge about wildfire manage management might have been um, the best thing that we could have been doing for the last hundred years. So perhaps we will do that um, moving forward for the next hundred years. And as I um, record this for you, um, there is an exceedingly intense heat wave um, pounding into uh, the entire Western United States right now, um, for driving again additional fires, um, making the, the drought situation worse. Um, so the projections for Labor Day weekend are dire. And um, by the time you're watching this, we will be past Labor Day, but hopefully you will be um, keeping in mind that these issues coming together have really complicated um, how we deal with all of these emergencies and how we really build community resilience. So one of the things that we've always said is the key to resilience is to work with nature's new clock, um, wherever you are, whenever you are. And we're now not only working with the clock, but we're working with her um, introduction of other things that we have driven, um, diseases and, and impacts to um, air, water, and land. And so we need to learn to be resilient to this new structure. Um, but we also need to learn to how, how we minimize these impacts moving forward. But I want to end on a positive note. And the positive note is to say that one of the things that's come out of our COVID working group um, that we had been identified earlier is the notion of food sovereignty on tribal reservations. Um, tribal food sovereignty had been a topic that we had been dealing with um, when we were looking primarily at the, the epidemic of climate change. Um, and now with the impacts of COVID, um, not only the disease itself, but the shutdowns, the limited access to food supplies, um, many of our tribal partners, and I know this is happening in indigenous communities around the country and the world, have really um, enhanced and are building their food sovereignty programs. Um, so one thing that we know is that under the CARES Act funding, um, these food sovereignty programs have been extend, expanded substantially. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to give a little plug for a group discussion that I'm leading immediately after this. You get a half an hour break to uh, grab a cup of coffee and come back and join us. But what we are looking in that discussion is to really share uh, best practices um, and identify communities of practice that are working on food sovereignty programs in tribal communities and to see how we can share information um, quickly. Um, this is an example, these photos are example of some of the hoop house programs that we've been working with, but there's uh, gardening projects, there's livestock, there's livestock processing, um, meat processing, there's a whole range of things that can make uh, communities more resilient by having uh, stronger food supplies and food access. And so I hope you can join us um, for that discussion. I would love your input. So with that, I'm going to close um, thanking my team, of course, and welcoming you to join us. I will um, put these, this information in the chat box as well. If you want to learn more about Native Waters, um, please check out our website. Our story map has um, a whole series of stories and resources from the work that we've done on COVID. And if anybody is interested in joining our COVID calls, please do. We would welcome participation from anyone. And you can do that by just sending an email to Vicki Hebb or myself. So with that, thank you. Um, stay safe at this time. And I welcome hearing your questions and joining discussions with you throughout the conference. Thank you.